Hi, and welcome back to the second part of our lecture summary for chapter 10. Um, as I mentioned the last time, um, because there's so much good stuff in this chapter, at least in my opinion, I've decided to divide the summary lectures into two parts. So last time we were just talking about basic campaign development, and today what I want to focus on are these theories that your book introduced that um, people who design campaigns use to sort of guide some of the decisions that they make, particularly when it comes to audience targeting and message design. Like, how do we actually make a campaign that's going to be, um, that's going to reach a particular group and hopefully make them um, comply in whatever way uh, we're trying to make them comply. Um, last time, remember, we talked a lot about how different campaigns have different goals. And you'll see that a lot of these theories are driven towards trying to figure out what are the factors um, and a message that can make somebody more or less likely to comply to a certain behavior. Um, but some of this stuff will apply to other goals like awareness um, and maybe even political action too. So, um, okay, so the first um, theory that your book brings up is um, social cognitive theory. Um, this is actually, the theory used to be called uh, social learning theory. Um, and it's an oldie and a goodie. And it's actually one that we're gonna probably come back to a little bit later on. Um, it's one of these really classic uh, psychology theories that uh, is applied to campaigns, but it's also applied to so much more. Um, Bandura originally developed this theory um, to sort of explain how, um, though it seems simple now, um, to explain how humans don't necessarily have to experience something in order to learn something. Uh, we can watch somebody else and all, actually learn to do a behavior. And a lot of um, the other parts of the theory uh, talks about what are the motivating factors that determine whether an act whether we actually do the behavior or not. Um, this is a popular theory, again, um, one that we'll address later when we talk about how entertainment, for instance, can be used to teach people health messages and maybe um, get them to model different characters um, uh, in an episode if they're performing good or bad health behaviors, right? So it, we'll come back to this when we start asking questions about why people want to copycat um, things that they see on TV um, for better or worse. Um, but this chapter, relating it to campaigns, uh, really talked about how um, the theory kind of has, if you break it down. There's a lot of parts, but this is a this is um, supposed to make it very easily digestible. If you break it down, it has two main components. Um, and to quote the actual book, um, social cognitive theory is guided by uh, two basic principles. One is that um, behaviors are guided by, first of all, expectations that an action will lead to an outcome. In other words, people are more likely to perform a behavior if they actually can see that behavior re, um, resulting in some sort of desired outcome, or they're likely to stay away from a behavior if, for instance, they believe it'll result in an undesirable outcome. Um, and secondly, and this is the one I really want you to focus on, um, behaviors are guided by the expectation that a person has about, by the expectation a person has about their ability to perform the action. In other words, people will perform a behavior not only if they think that the behavior is actually going to result in what they want it to result in, but also if they believe that they have the ability to do it. Um, you might see a lot of merit in doing something like exercising, but if you don't feel like you have the ability to perform that behavior, then you're still not going to do it no matter um, how much you believe that the behavior is going to result in a positive outcome for you, for instance. Um, this is linked to this idea of self-efficacy, a really important vocabulary word, um, I think, for health comm in general, particularly when you talk about um, why people do or do not perform different types of health behaviors. Um, self-efficacy um, refers to a person's feeling or confidence in their ability to perform some sort of um, behavior. Um, in a minute, we're going to talk about a different type of efficacy, response efficacy, which more refers to um, the ability, the belief that um, the behavior will accomplish whatever you want to it want it to accomplish, which if you think about it, is sort of similar to that other tenet of social cognitive theory. Anyway, the reason this is important, you know, sort of thinking about it as applied, we think about theories as like, oh, there's, that's all theoretical. Well, the truth is we use these theories in a very applied way when we're trying to design messages um, that hopefully will have a desired effect on people. And the reason this is relevant is because if you design a message and don't take into um, people's uh, 
felt self-efficacy for it, for instance, the message might not be effective, even if it's a really good message. Um, going back, I've mentioned before, I, I did some research in um, emergency room situations, trying to figure out how to get patients that were not using primary care and instead using um, the emergency room for primary care needs, like to, you know, a classic example, they had a toothache. And so they would come to the emergency room for a toothache, even though that's not a true emergency. Um, we were doing formative research to try to figure out well, what sort of message would appeal to them if we said, well, use a primary care provider instead? Um, the problem is, is, is our research sort of suggested that even though a lot of people um, in this community um, understood that it wasn't ideal to go to the emergency room, it wasn't good for them, they had to wait longer, um, you know, all sorts of problems um, came up for them, they still didn't have self-efficacy to actually go to a primary care physician. Part of this had to do with availability of primary care in their neighborhood. If they didn't have, um, if they were working several jobs, if they also had low um, income and no health insurance, um, all of these factors sort of fit into their feelings that they could actually go to a primary care provider and get what they needed. So no matter how persuasive we were, right, about saying, stop calling 911. Instead, go to a primary care provider for these types of things. Um, because they had low levels of self-efficacy that needed to be addressed first, um, that message wasn't going to be successful. Um, another sort of application of this is thinking about how maybe a campaign message could address people's low levels of self-efficacy. Um, another theory that was mentioned is the theory of reasoned action. Um, this is all focused on behavioral intentions. The underlying premise of the theory is that if people intend to do a behavior, um, it's more likely that they will. I mean, um, it's one of my criticisms of the theory, actually, because sometimes I don't think behavioral intentions always do lead to the behavior, but still, I understand um, you've got a better shot, right, if people are intending versus not intending to do something. Um, and like sort of social cognitive theory, we can break this down into two major premises. One is, is that um, people's attitude towards the behavior is going to affect their intentions to do it. So again, if people have a positive attitude towards a particular behavior, they're more likely to intend to do it. Um, but also, um, my favorite part is this appraisal of social norms. People tend to um, take into consideration whatever their the social norms are around them when deciding whether or not they're actually going to enact a behavior or not. Um, so this is relevant, for instance, if um, let's say somebody's trying to decide to quit smoking and they notice actually that all of their friends, everybody around them, maybe even their work environment, um, WVU I was just thinking is now a smoke-free campus. Um, so they notice that the social norms actually are not very supportive of smoking. That actually might help them, right? Because the behavior they're considering is actually in line with the social norms in that case. Um, but sometimes social norms can have a negative effect. So um, if you want to, um, the book mentions, if you want to start um, engaging in help, more healthy eating and more exercise, but your family or your friends don't eat like that or don't exercise, then no matter how good your attitudes are towards exercise, that social norm could actually inhibit um, your uh, ability, to, well, desire and possibly your ability to feel like you could actually do that um, successfully. Um, one more example I was thinking about, um, I'm not sure if you realize, but there's a huge problem right now with older adults and STDs. Um, older adults um, actually do have sex and um, they, um, because, you know, they are dating just like uh, younger adults do, uh, will often, you know, have um, multiple sexual partners, you know, throughout their dating lives. And so STDs are becoming an increasing problem. But they are not getting tested regularly um, because I don't think there's a social norm, um, even perceived among doctors, but even, uh, particularly among older adults, that they need to do something like that, right? It's not just the, it's not the socially acceptable thing for them to do yet, but sometimes social norms can change. It's another example of where um, that perception of social norm can really affect whether or not people um, perform desirable health behaviors. Um, okay, so another theory that came up, and let me see, I just printed out, um, I love this, this is actually the figure in your book, let me just make sure you can see it here, this is the, um, can you see it, oh, I can't get this, I'm terrible at this, okay, this is, hold on, okay, let me get that, so this is the extended parallel processing model, and it looks really complicated, but I'm going to reduce this to you um, pretty pretty simply, just like the other theories, I hope, into um, sort of a main premise. Um, 
The extended parallel processing model is interested in how people process messages that contain some level of fear. We all know that some messages are designed specifically to scare the crap out of people, right? Um, think about the, uh, the warning labels, um, the, the debate about putting warning labels on cigarette um, cartons that show like pictures of black and lungs and, and um, disgusting pictures of like holes in people's throats and, and those types of things, right? Um, it's like a high fear appeal. But other fear appeals, we see them in political ads, um, we see them um, f maybe fear appeals related to environmental things or whatever. Um, death, right? Oh, the drug ads always use a lot of fear appeals, right? Like uh, the, uh, think about um, all of the meth commercials that came out in the past few years um, that show people like getting acne and whatever, just, you know, really high threat based imagery um, and messages from these um, different commercials and ads and things. So this this model is concerned with whether or not that's a good thing or not, um, because the argument would go, if, people weren't afraid, why would they be motivated to do anything? And the extended parallel processing model does say that. If you don't have any sort of threat, then people don't, if they don't perceive a threat, then why would they do anything to fix it? Um, but uh, basically the bottom line with this model says that um, too much fear can actually be very harmful. Um, if people are so afraid of something and they actually feel like they can't do anything about it, then they're gonna have the opposite um, effect uh, the, the message is going to have the opposite effect and people might actually shut it out or they might focus too much on their fear and not actually on processing the things that you want them to do about it. But specifically, going back to social cognitive theory, the extended parallel processing model suggests that there have to be two things in a good fear, in a good fear appeal situation. The first thing is you do have to have that level of threat. But in addition to threat, people also have to have a high level of self-efficacy. If you scare people and they don't feel like there's any way to do anything about the thing that they're scared about, then it's not going to have a very good um, effect, right? Because people will just feel afraid without actually feeling like they have the tools to get away from that fearful situation. Um, same thing with response efficacy, which I mentioned before. If people feel like they're very afraid, but they don't actually believe that the behavior you're recommending is actually going to help, eliminate any of that fear um, or that threat, then the message isn't going to have a good effect. Um, so, um, you know, this is uh, thinking about, let's see, what's a good example of this? Um, <clears throat> well, um, getting back to the, let's go back to smoking examples. If you scare somebody into um, not uh, trying to quit smoking and they feel like they've been smoking for years and they're going to get lung cancer and they're legitimately scared. But perhaps because of social norms, they feel like they're not going to have the ability to quit either because they're too addicted or like I said, maybe the, the in their social environment, they don't have a strong level of support. Um, they're going to turn, be turned off to that message. On the other hand, a person who maybe was already considering it feels like they have adequate resources to actually quit. Maybe they can get some, I don't know anything about this, but some Nicorette or go to a support group or those types of things. Those people are going to respond much more positively to that fear, fear appeal. Um, so that's the basic premise of um, extended parallel processing model. Self-efficacy is key. Response efficacy is also key. You can scare people, but you need to make sure that they um, feel like they can do something about the thing that they're scared about. Again, thinking about how that factors into campaign design, um, addressing those issues of self-efficacy, and also making sure that your message is aimed at a population that already has a certain level of self-efficacy um, can make all the difference in the world. Um, finally, um, this isn't really so much a theory, but it's something I definitely wanted to bring up. Your book talks about these stages of change models, um, specifically mentions the trans theoretical model. Essentially, this is just a consideration that people can be in different stages of readiness to adopt a particular behavior. Um, some people who have low levels of awareness might, awareness might not even know that they need to adopt a particular behavior. So they would be in the, this um, pre-contemplation stage. Um, whereas people who might be thinking about it, they might already be on the fence and considering doing something, could be in a contemplation page, uh, contemplation stage, those who've already made it by their mind, tomorrow I'm going to like get on the treadmill or whatever, those um, people would be in the preparation stage. The people who are actually going out and doing it, I'm on the treadmill now, <laughs> not quite. 
although that would make an interesting interesting lecture, um, are in the action stage. And then um, maintenance relapse phase are for people who have already adopted a particular behavior and are continuing to do it, or who relapse. And if you relapse, that basically means that you go somewhere back in one of those other stages. Um, I think this is a pretty simple concept. I really hope it is. The reason we even talk about this stuff is because of what we talked about in the last summary lecture, right? Audience analysis. Um, it's hard to target a message to people who might be in all different types of stages, but it's very easy if you know that all of the people who are in the pre-contemplation stage don't even know anything, so you need to raise awareness, or all of the people in the um, maintenance stage, right? What they just need is like a little bit of a kick in the butt to keep doing what they're doing, motivation. Um, and this is just a really helpful way to conceptualize um, different audience phases so that you can better tailor your message. Um, okay, um, I think that's it for now. We will discuss a couple of more theories in the third part. Uh, just a couple more. One will be one in the book and I think the other one will be something different. But I um, hope you're enjoying this. Uh, thanks so much. See you next time.